Many thanks to everyone for being with us over these, these three days. And it's great to see such a full house uh, for this last final segment of the 2017 World Forum. So we have uh, coming up, of course, uh, we'll uh, cap off the three days with the Disruptive Dozen. And when that's finished, uh, Ann Klebanski, Dr. Klebanski, will point us forward to 2018. But prior to Disruptive Dozen, we have uh, a panel uh, that we're all excited about, Skinny on Fat. And then importantly, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Betsy Nabel interviewing Dr. Dr. Gary Gibbons, uh, the current and a former head of the NHLBI. And I just wanted to call attention to, uh, to all the attendees to a great program that also uh, rests under Betsy among the many responsibilities at Brigham is the administration of the uh, Boston Biomedical Innovation Center, which is an NHLBI funded program, kind of a, cutting some new ground under the uh, National Center for Accelerated Innovation that Gary and his team implemented at, uh, at NHLBI and is now being mimicked elsewhere in NIH. Three centers were established, and one of them right here in Boston. This is a great public-private partnership. If you're in a company and you, or you're an investor and you don't know about it, I would encourage you to connect with our team here uh, who manage BBEC. And if you're one of our uh, faculty members and you're not aware, please reach out because it's a great source of support and, as you can see in the graphic, a bridge to uh, clinical applications. And uh, Tony's going to introduce uh, the next panel. Thanks so much, Chris. So uh, welcome back. And I really think we now have a unique opportunity to really hear from Gary Gibbons, who, as Chris just said, is the uh, head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood uh, Institute um, and a leader in uh, thinking about how we move forward as a nation um, in addressing these really important uh, uh, issues and, and, and the need for discovery in this space. Um, just a word about Gary. He uh, really has had a distinguished uh, career, starting with a distinguished career in academia when he was at the Brigham and then at Stanford and then at Morehouse College of Medicine, where he was the head of cardiovascular research and also the chair of the Department of Physiology before being recruited to the NIH as the head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, NHLBI, as I think everyone here knows, is the third largest institute at the NIH. It has a budget of $3 billion and 1,000 employees and um, is really, for this audience in particular, probably the most important institute um, and really setting the agenda for cardiovascular research um, uh, across the nation. Um, and Gary has had the... Um, uh, privilege of providing leadership for that during what have certainly been um, uh, interesting times over the last few years. We were all delighted to learn last week that the NIH will continue to have a budget, in fact, a, an increase um, uh, uh, in, at least until the end of September. Uh, what happens after September, I think, uh, uh, is cause for some speculation, but we're certainly hopeful that uh, we can see uh, some compromise reached where it will move forward uh, in a similar fashion. And I can really think of no one better to interview Gary then Betsy Nabel, who, all, as all of you know, is the president of Brigham Health, but has had her own distinguished career um, both in academia um, as a leader, an investigator, um, a chief of cardiology previously, an interventional cardiologist at one point in her life, um, and, uh, and, and importantly, as the prior head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So we're really looking forward to hearing this uh, discussion and, and hearing about a vision for the future of moving forward in these uncertain times. So please join me in welcoming Betsy and Gary to the stage. Well, welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to have you back in Boston. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's a great uh, personal pleasure of mine. Uh, Gary and I uh, first met at Harvard Medical School and the Brigham uh, back in our very early uh, training days. You're and not going to say how long ago. No, I'm, I'm not, not going to say that. And, and have had the great pleasure of being friends and colleagues uh, since then. Gary, let's start out uh, by talking a little bit about innovation. Obviously, innovation has been one of the major topics throughout the past few days. Um, and one of the great pleasures of being 
uh, an institute, NIH Institute director, is being able uh, to uh, take ideas uh, and develop policy and uh, initiate uh, scientific funding for partic particular areas. Tell us a little bit about what excites you most about what's going on at the NHLBI right now. What sort of innovative projects and ideas have you been thinking about? Okay. Uh, well, that's a challenging one. It's like uh, being asked, you know, what's your favorite child of my three? <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of things. Uh, one, I, I guess, is uh, a sense of um, excitement and actually appreciation that you know, this is a position that's a privilege of public service. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so much of what our mission is to turn discovery science into enhancing the health of the nation really comes from the folks who are in the audience. And so, uh, it's really about uh, the excitement of enabling others uh, to pursue um, their, their questions that they're passionate mm -hmm. about. Uh, in that regard, um, as you say, we, we have an opportunity to sort of aim where, where we put $3 billion. And, uh, I think the best thing we can do uh, is to promote investigator-initiated discovery science as sort of fundamental bedrock of what I think NIH does best, what I think we contribute most to this uh, ecosystem uh, that we've been talking about for the last two and a half days. And uh, although we've had our uh, austere budget challenges uh, over the last five years, uh, despite the fact that our budget's basically been flat, uh, we've actually increased uh, the pay line uh, mm -hmm. uh, a percentile a year uh, over the last five years and uh, expanded the number of est early established uh, investigators mm -hmm. who've been funded over that same period. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we've initiated a program called the R35 that actually funds programs and people, mm -hmm. not just projects like the classic R01. All of this is intended to really empower uh, the real innovators that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that that investment in understanding basically how the body works uh, and what goes wrong when a disease uh, intervenes uh, is fundamentally what it's all about and really prioritizing uh, that as a key objective. Yeah. I think uh, one of the interesting uh, facts about the NHLBI uh, is that it historically um, has used a, a larger uh, percentage uh, of its appropriated money to support investigator-initiated research, and by that we mean uh, the RO1s and the PO1s, uh, et cetera. Uh, is that still the case, uh, Gary? Absolutely. It's, I think uh, it's a tradition. I, I give Claude credit. I yes, you credit. Uh, and uh, indeed, I think our uh, track record on early stage investigators is uh, at the lead across mm -hmm. the NIH, uh, in part from the policy that you put in to give that 10% um, uh, bonus handicap uh, that's enabled uh, the next generation to get a step. Yeah. And for our young investigators uh, here in, in the audience who are initiating their uh, careers, Gary, tell us a little bit about your thinking regarding uh, the K grants, the KR grants. What, what's the current success rate? Uh, what, what's your thinking? So, so again, I think uh, that's when I came in uh, uh, about five years ago now, there, there had been a slide, uh, quite mm -hmm. frankly, in the success rates uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the K awards. But again, I think that's one of the most uh, sacrosanct parts uh, of the job is looking for the, ne the next generation. In fact, it was the, my favorite part of this meeting, quite frankly, was uh, listening to that first look session yeah. uh, where we had uh, 19 folks from uh, the Brigham and the General uh, just excited about their ideas, passionate. Uh, that, that's, that's what makes uh, what we do very worthwhile. Uh, and uh, so now we've uh, pumped up that K award uh, up to about a success rate in the 40s. Well, that's fabulous. Uh, so absolutely. Great. And actually, uh, we actually increased <laughs> the stipend for the first time since probably we were fellows. Yeah. Uh, still not a, probably enough, but from 75 to 100,000. That's, that's outstanding. So that's a plug for all <laughs> trainees and early investigators in the audience. Hang uh, in there. Absolutely. And, and this is a, a, a data driven investment in the sense that. We know that uh, uh, probably uh, of our K awardees, approximately 50% of them eventually convert over to be R01 funded investigators. So we, we recognize that that's uh, a part of our pipeline. And if you, you get over that bar, uh, you, 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 you have the potential uh, perhaps to be a lifer yeah. uh, in terms of NIH uh, funded PI. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the questions that everybody's dying to know. Mm -hmm. What is it like to be in Washington these days? Um, what, what is your read of the situation? And I'm going to paraphrase this uh, by saying that the NHLBI director position is not a presidential appointee. It's appointed by the NIH director. 
that in that role, one learns uh, very quickly uh, to be very bipartisan, uh, both with the executive branch as well as the legislative uh, branch. And one learns to move across uh, administrations, hopefully fairly seamlessly. Mm -hmm. So I started with the Clinton administration, worked through the entire Bush, and, and ended with the Obama. And you came into the Obama, and now it transitioned in, into the Trump. So we expect your comments to be very bipartisan, but give us a sense of what the flavor is like these days. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it, I think one of the things that I did appreciate uh, and uh, in the engagement uh, with Congress, obviously a critical stakeholder for all of us, uh, is the notion that when we break it down, one of the themes of this meeting uh, is again providing value to patients. Um, at the end of the day, uh, despite what you might think of politicians, um, some of them have been patients, will be patients, have family members that are patients. Uh, they recognize that uh, uh, diseases uh, don't come with a label of D, R, or I. Uh, and actually, as I'm sure you know, that when you brief them or educate them, as we're, we're allowed to do, um, away from television cameras and microphones, um, they get that this is important investment of the taxpayer dollars uh, because I believe we've demonstrated that it has value to the people who vote for them. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I think this audience uh, uh, collectively should be proud of the fact that um, the, the interventions in cardiovascular disease that have resulted in that 70% reduction in, in heart disease deaths over the last 50 years mm -hmm. is in part related to that return on investment. So I think it's almost a poster child um, uh, in terms of the, the investment yeah. uh, of taxpayer dollars that is really paying off. They also recognize that uh, most of the $3 billion we have doesn't stay in, uh, in at least in my pocket uh, or in Washington, but is disseminated across the 50 states mm -hmm. and a lot of the districts that they represent. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you, you go through the halls, uh, I think that's part of that cultivation of that mm -hmm. bipartisan support. Yeah, that's great. So you're, you're still sensing pretty broad bipartisan support for yeah. the NIH? Yeah, no, I think it's there. Uh, I think it's, um, it's something we have to stay uh, vigilant about and persistent about. Uh, obviously, as you know, we, mm -hmm. we can't lobby in this position, uh, but it's important for uh, the, the citizens uh, and stakeholders in this audience uh, to continue to press the case uh, uh, that this is an important investment. Um, and I think it's a testimony to the fact that uh, we did get a plus up mm -hmm. in this FY17, despite some, some headwinds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's again reflective of the, 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 the uh, depth of support uh, for the uh, Congress that's there, uh, that they thought this was an important thing to make. Yeah, I think Gary, you make a couple of really important points that as federal employees, one cannot lobby a federal employee of the executive branch who can't lobby the legislative branch. Um, so it really is incumbent upon all of us as private citizens mm -hmm. to do that lobbying and that advocacy for, for NIH funding. And uh, whether you're in academics uh, or, or the, the public sector, pharma, biotech, whatever, that speaking out and that, that uh, lobbying uh, is uh, critically uh, in important. Um, you know, I think the, the other fact that you point out is that uh, at the end of the day, most congressional members want to do right mm -hmm. by their constituencies, and they understand that health and health care is an important component. Uh, and uh, uh, speaking to their hearts, no pun intended, yes. Is, yes. Is, is a good way to, to drive that, that advocacy. So, you know, if you were to look out with a, a crystal ball, um, you think uh, there's the president's budget for FY17 starts to hit Congress. In, any early reads on what you think the atmosphere is going to be like? Um, what you're saying for FY18? For FY18. Uh, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so you and the rest of the audience knows that uh, the new administration put out a skinny budget, uh, sort of an outline, uh, and in it was about a 20% um, decrease uh, in IH funding. Um, uh, and clearly, as you also alluded to, I am part of the executive branch of HHS, HHS and so uh, we're going to have to, to, to work uh, within those parameters. But uh, everyone who's you know, had Civics 101 knows that the president can certainly uh, propose uh, a budget. 
at the end of the day, it's up to the appropriators uh, uh, to give us our budget. And uh, uh, I'm hopeful and optimistic that the signal we got, that despite the climate um, and despite the change, uh, there was still a $2 billion plus up in 17. Uh, we would think it odd uh, for after two successive years of plus ups uh, to then cut us to 20 percent. Uh, so uh, can never say never in this yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. uh, yep. I've learned not to uh, rely on crystal balls, but uh, we're hopeful that it, it certainly won't be as draconian yeah. as that. Uh, and we'll need a lot of uh, advocacy to, to see uh, what, what happens next. Yeah, yeah. terrific. So what, one of the um, extraordinary legacies uh, of the NHLBI uh, are the large population-based cohort studies. Uh, and that certainly is a legacy that both of us uh, walk, walked into and, and gained a, a fine appreciation uh, for. And by those large cohort studies, I, I'm really talking about the Framingham Heart Study, which was really the first. And uh, this was a, a study, as many of you know, started by the Public Health Service in 1948. Uh, and uh, it came at a time when World War II vets were coming back and uh, we didn't understand the causes of heart disease. And it was really initiated to understand the risk factors for heart disease. And that then led to a long uh, legacy of public health policy and, and programs to lower blood pressure and, uh, and uh, cholesterol in, in this country. So uh, update us, uh, Gary. Wh where are we uh, in terms of these legacy studies, the Framingham Heart Study, uh, Eric, uh, Jackson Heart Study, mm -hmm. uh, maybe educate us a bit about, about what's currently in the portfolio and mm -hmm. currently wh what are, where are we going with them? Okay, that, no, that's great. It, it, as you say, it's um, really a privilege to have inherited such a great mm -hmm. legacy uh, stretching back over s almost 70 years now. Uh, and uh, I think we have a great opportunity to, to reinvent uh, a lot of those cohorts uh, that started in the 20th century and in 21st century sort of way. Uh, and uh, one of the elements that we're, we're very excited about uh, is leveraging uh, uh, those uh, cohorts that now really measure in the hundreds of thousands of people, if you consider Women's Health Initiative along with Framingham Jackson, yeah. Eric Mesa, and the others, uh, toward uh, a program we're calling Top Mid, uh, which is uh, uh, something of our precision medicine contribution to the mix, uh, where we leverage these longitudinal cohorts and um, uh, layer on top we're calling transomics for precision medicine uh, and uh, really extending a legacy that you started uh, in, in, in inserting genomic uh, technologies uh, of high throughput uh, assessments into uh, those cohorts. Uh, now uh, putting a bet down on a whole genome sequencing. Uh, so uh, uh, we're on a pathway now uh, where at this stage we've reached about 70,000 uh, whole genomes across mm -hmm. those various uh, cohorts um, that have phenotypes across our portfolio of heart, lung, blood, uh, mm -hmm. and sleep. Uh, and, um, and we have the ambitious uh, target of getting over 100,000. Uh, and uh, to create what we hope is a, a new um, a, a sort of genomic, phenomic uh, resource uh, that uh, in, in many ways will challenge precedent, mm -hmm. I think, uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, an entity that both has the deep sequencing, the deep phenotyping superimposed on all that longitudinal uh, follow-up uh, that should be a rich, rich uh, data source. Uh, we're also very intentional in making sure it was uh, inclusive and diverse uh, in a way that reflects uh, the diversity of our, our nation. Uh, and so we've been uh, a very uh, intentional in ensuring that uh, uh, race ethnic groups were uh, strongly mm -hmm. represented. Um, and um, uh, I think this gives us a great opportunity. We're now uh, starting to, to move to uh, think about a platform that kind of, uh, quite frankly, leapfrogs the traditional DB gap, uh, sort of download uh, kind of model to one that's more uh, of a data lake, uh, data commons uh, sort of concept, probably cloud-based, uh, where indeed uh, investigators, both uh, public and private sectors, uh, could go to this data uh, in a cloud-based uh, format uh, and compute uh, in that mm -hmm. context. So uh, we think it's, a, it's an opportunity both uh, to create this resource, but part of that um, uh, forward looking toward opportunities in data science and big yeah. data. Yeah, that's, that's really terrific. Um, 
tell us a little bit what's going what, what's going on now at the NIH around data sciences uh, writ large. Um, the work that you're doing on top med will that in uh, uh, data analytics in, in a cloud-like setting is that something that's part of a, a broader effort uh, at the NIH around data sciences? Yes, very good. It it, it is something we're we're trying to 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 uh, to be at that leading edge. Um, uh, you very well know that uh, NIH sometimes challenged to do things uh, uh, as an enterprise uh, with 27 ICs, uh, but we're hopeful that this is sort of a model uh, because, uh, quite frankly, uh, we've probably generated 15 pentabytes worth of whole genome sequencing data, uh, not too easily to, to download and put on, one on a drive. And so, so this is common across all ICs. So to create platforms uh, that not only can store uh, but have uh, the ability of, of both uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, reusability, the fair uh, sort of criteria mm -hmm. that can span across, uh, mm -hmm. I think is increasingly going to be important. Mm -hmm. And it'd be uh, most beneficial if that's an NIH-wide mm -hmm. uh, sort of strategy, particularly relating to, to standards and APIs necessary to get that interoperability uh, and harmonization of data. As you also very well know, um, the iconic Framingham study was used as much to study osteoporosis, mm -hmm. um, stroke, um, dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to the degree to which we can take some of those studies, it also helps other uh, of the ICs to, yeah. to plug in and pursue the questions related to their mission as well. Yeah, terrific. What do you think uh, are the most important three questions in cardiovascular biology? Oh, boy. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, I don't even know where to start here. Um, so uh, I was intrigued by the uh, uh, previous panel uh, that uh, uh, our, our foundational bedrock touchstone still needs to be um, discovery science and understanding the biology, uh, both what promotes wellness and I would say resilience um, and appreciating what are those biological processes that um, you know, and enable uh, that, that healthy aging, um, mm -hmm. uh, despite this disease of aging. Um, it, similarly, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that, uh, well, I, I take what Rob Califf uh, said, we're sucking wind uh, in cardiovascular disease. Uh, and quite frankly, particularly in heart failure, I, I must say I'm disappointed yeah. uh, that uh, almost scientific malpractice, I think, that. We, we don't have more that we can do for patients, yeah. particularly for those who preserve ejection fractions. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we can learn how to phenotype and, and understand molecular pathways better there. Uh, I am excited about, um, uh, throughout our whole portfolio, um, some opportunities in, in uh, reparative biology, regenerative mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, not for the cardiovascular audience per se, but uh, sickle cell disease, as you know, is in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And uh, as one of the oldest molecular diseases that affects um, a minority population, in particular in this country, uh, this is one where uh, I think the time is right uh, to do something. Uh, we're still doing transfusion and using a drug that uh, NHLBI pioneered 25 mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, and with new gene editing mm -hmm. technologies, stem cell, uh, et cetera, uh, I think we have an opportunity to really start thinking about a cure. Yeah. Uh, for this, both for children and adults. Uh, and I'd like to see more innovation in that space. And uh, again, I think the time is right, one where we could create an ecosystem of public, private, and academia mm -hmm. that uh, can make that final push. Yeah, yeah, that, that's terrific. Gary, tell us a little bit about your, your thinking with respect to value-based healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, the NHLBI does not engage in any delivery of care. Mm -hmm. Uh, but can certainly study implementation mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, can study innovative methods to deliver care. H how much of that is the Institute getting into? Is this value-based health care, is this really something for providers and payers to, to really sort of work out or the NHLBI to sit on the, on the sideline mm -hmm. and focus on investigative research? What, what, what's your thinking about that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great point that... Uh, uh, although we obviously still emphasize basic uh, fundamental discovery science is really bedrock, um, uh, our mission at the end of the day is uh, at the National Institutes of Health uh, is to turn that discovery science, again, 
into enhancements in health. Uh, and I don't think we can just wait uh, on the basic science part. It needs to translate. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm certainly a believer that uh, commercialization uh, and innovation uh, to commercialize, mm -hmm. commercialize uh, mm -hmm. is one of the means of translating things to the patient mm -hmm. uh, and to the systems necessary to, mm -hmm. to care for them. Um, that's not only just early translation uh, and proof of concept and mechanism, uh, but also what we call T4 translation, real world settings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we set up a center for translational uh, research and implementation science. We call it Citrus. Uh, that really focuses in on that part uh, of the spectrum uh, because I, I think we, we really haven't done our full job. Uh, I can't look that congressman uh, in, mm -hmm. in the eye or congresswoman in the eye and say uh, that we're, we're giving value to American people if indeed I just show them a bunch of New England Journal articles and, and science papers, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, indeed their, their rates of death are still happening mm -hmm. uh, at a high rate. And a lot of times that means taking what we know and, and making sure uh, we can operationally and more effectively uh, make sure uh, patients are taken care of better. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that is also an area of innovation and research questions and research approaches, and I think it, it falls within our mission. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I'm going to take a few uh, questions fr uh, from the audience. Uh, so if you are, are interested in asking uh, Dr. Gibbons some questions, please go ahead and, and enter, and uh, uh, we'll proceed. So um, a couple questions uh, here. Uh, Matthew asks, large cohorts and big data infrastructure are very expensive. Won't this large bet damage the investigator-initiated R01 pay line? You can't have it all. So that's, <laughs> that, that in the vernacular uh, we call the big science uh, versus the letting a thousand flowers bloom controversy. Right. What, what's, right. what's your position on well, that? I, I think we tried to, uh, to indicate a track record where I think we are doing both, that uh, we've Again, year over year, increase the pay line, despite a flat budget, uh, despite being post sequester, and have made uh, these investments. Uh, again, I think it's it's uh, uh, a prudent part of stewardship to be sure we get uh, return on investment without question. Uh, but um, I, I'd almost feel derelict if we had an iconic Framingham Heart Study, and uh, someone wanted to understand epigenomic changes over time uh, and link that uh, to changes in pathobiology, uh, literally that's a priceless data set. Mm -hmm. And to not layer on uh, the latest technologies uh, that we have, I think uh, uh, that would be scientific malpractice mm -hmm. in my view. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I think we want to uh, be, be sure we have a balanced portfolio and we like to believe we're trying to do that. Great. So Ram asked, related to this, is the data that's generated from the NHL, NHLBI supported parens, taxpayer and parens studies open for all to see and mine? Your thoughts, comments? Yeah, no, so I, I uh, take that point very uh, uh, seriously. I think uh, um, we have uh, a uh, task as public servants uh, to uh, do science as a public good. Um, I, I'm always reminded that when I come to my, my second home here in Boston, uh, that it's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, and we're not too far from the Boston Commons, uh, that the founders of this nation uh, recognize there are certain resources that you put uh, in the public square for everybody to use. And I think uh, that's really the, the best part uh, of science, particularly that early um, uh, pre-competition space uh, ought to be there uh, for others to use. And so that's part of the reason we want to to make top mid of uh, this uh, genome phenome resource uh, in the cloud to make it more accessible uh, with the, the usual uh, 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 elements of controlled access for privacy and appropriate use of consented information. Uh, so I think that's our challenge now is how can we make this um, uh, more open? Similarly, I, I alluded to the notion of making it fair and compatible. Uh, if it's interoperable and harmonized, uh, it should be in a way that a, a machine uh, could indeed uh, mine through. And, and again, uh, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence in this meeting. Uh, we'd love for uh, those applications to occur. Uh, so it's not only the folks who uh, shepherd at the field centers, uh, these cohorts, but others who uh, may not be uh, epidemiologists be able to see patterns uh, that uh, otherwise be difficult mm -hmm. to discern. Yeah, good. Let me ask you a question about um, funding. 
there's a little bit of a buzz going on now about, uh, you know, will there be a cap on the number of grants mm -hmm. that a particular investigator mm -hmm. can have? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's also some uh, discussion around uh, how grants are selected for funding using various factors or s uh, selection criteria or impact factors. What, what is your thinking about this, and, and how have you approached funding pay lines at the NHLBI? Well, it, it is certainly something that's under discussion. Um, I think that's, a, again, part of being uh, accountable stewards. The things that we are using uh, in terms of our, our metrics of success uh, has guided the, where we've doubled down and where we, we haven't uh, made as much uh, of an increase in a tight budget. These are the trade-offs. Uh, so the things that I've talked about increasing have actually data behind them as to their return. Um, uh, I must say that, uh, as you're probably aware, um, there's kind of a Pareto principle, you know, 2080 uh, element that goes on that probably 20% of the investigators, uh, you know, take up more than 50% of the grants uh, that are out there. And uh, some might question uh, whether indeed that's the mm -hmm. biggest bang for buck, particularly as certain pools shrink particularly the, if it squeezes out the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are things that uh, we have to keep an eye on mm -hmm. uh, and keeping that balance going. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a number of strategies. I, I'm not particularly enamored about an arbitrary rigid cutoff, mm -hmm. uh, but I think an increased scrutiny uh, with that and a weighing of the balance mm -hmm. is something to consider. One other final point is the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of us are probably overachievers, uh, uh, workaholics, uh, but you got to wonder, you know, it, when you have that fifth R01, do you really have the bandwidth uh, to be engaged in, and, and give value to mm -hmm. each of those projects? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those become uh, important questions to yeah. think about. Yeah, that's great. So we're, we're going to need to start to wrap up here. I'm just going to ask a couple kind of quick fire questions and okay. you can kind of short answers, yes, no. So the Framingham Heart Study, as many know, there have been three generations of cohorts, 1948, 1971, and I think it was like 2003. Will there be a fourth generation? Uh, I, I can't comment on the Framingham per se, but uh, we are interested uh, in launching um, one, perhaps two, uh, new cohorts. It's been a long time since NHLBI's launched a new cohort, could be uh, a, uh, uh, a offspring of, of an existing cohort, but it might be something different. Uh, we think that the population science space needs a refresh, mm -hmm. uh, I, and we'd like investigators to come in with their best ideas uh, and locales, of the best ideas yeah. to build on. Uh, I must admit, now that I have um, three millennials, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I think that they're, they're growing up in a different context. We're also learning that uh, you know, coronary disease probably starts in utero and already has a trajectory by teenage. So maybe we ought to be studying uh, things younger. Yeah. I'm also hoping that, uh, listen to all the trialists, we, we might start to intervene earlier. Yeah. So I think we need to understand more about this yeah. disease in a way that actually maybe we can think about uh, preempting it earlier yeah. uh, in its course. Yeah, great. So. Gary, if you can impart one last message uh, to this audience, what would it be? Well, uh, I probably wouldn't have this job if I wasn't uh, a pragmatic optimist. Uh, so uh, I must admit that uh, uh, I, I remain optimistic despite these transitions in administration. Uh, I think uh, if you have a long-term view, uh, you'd, you'd want to bet uh, on uh, ongoing uh, investments uh, in investigators. And I was just so, again, excited about that first look group. Yeah. Uh, the future is bright. I, I don't think uh, there's a better time to be a clinician scientist trying to innovate in a way uh, that's going to make a difference for patients. So, uh, you know, I, I wish we could turn back the clock about 30 years. I, I'd do it again. Yeah, so. excellent, excellent. Well, Gary, we certainly thank you for your leadership. You are an extraordinary role model. I think Gary really epitomizes an individual who uh, invested in a career in academic medicine early on. Uh, established your scientific uh, credibility, went on to have great service uh, in academic institutions, and then now is leading a very, very important public institution. And as uh, Gary described, uh, this sort of 
work uh, really is public service. And uh, I, I hope, I, I, I'm sure you, you share my sentiments that uh, engaging in public service is, is a very honorable uh, task yeah. and, and has a, a number of rewards that go through it. Absolutely. Yeah. We wish you all the best. Okay. We need you in this position. And likewise. We, we need, need you, you to be <laughs> successful and please know that we are all here uh, to support uh, your success. Well, Gary. I appreciate Thank you that so message. much. Thank you.